like mm-hmm. yeah like we write some blogs and we are trying to <coughs> we are trying to build some mm-hmm. space education and ecosystem okay great yeah so to so sir today we will generally discuss uh, a question which is asked by the students which may be uh, mm-hmm. school students as well as the university students right mm-hmm. so it's uh, basically based on the its uh, future means uh, how how can they uh, pursue their future in uh, space technology or space based startup so more, most of questions are related to that field okay. yeah so good yeah yeah and uh, yeah isro friends club having a seven member of team right now and uh, we are looking for forward for the to giving the space education to the school student as well as the uh, university level student but for the university university level student we uh, we try to give the hands on experience like to make the rockets to make the satellites in, in the very nano set of eco set mm-hmm. right so uh, in the two or three months uh, we will uh, Uh, go forward for the hands on experience but for now in the in this pandemic we just give the space education to the school student okay sounds good yeah yeah which city are you based uh, so, in where where are you based uh, we are not from this uh, yeah it's just uh, online uh, online platform but uh, in the two or three months we are uh, starting our one office in that uh, we we work together all these team members Yeah, but where are you based now? Was it next? I'm from. I'm yeah. from Mysore. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm from Gujarat. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So our all the team members are from different different cities. Like uh, some of from the Madras, some of from the Bengal, some of from the Gujarat. So there's the different uh, uh, state students in our team. <laughs> Okay. And only, yeah, and only two members are uh, uh, undergraduate, and all the other members are from the schooling. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So this meeting is uh, recorded now, and uh, and at the six p.m. I will uh, live on the YouTube. Mm-hmm. Right. So so so, Babu, I will hand over to you, and uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can start. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm ready. Okay. So shall I start? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to the World Space Week 2020 Space Talk from the Space Talk Club, where we make space for everyone. So, guys, you all know that today uh, is the ending of the Space Week, and today we have a very special person with us, a very special person, a very special personality with us, uh, and his name is Dr. Narendra Prasad Sir. So. we are very much obliged to get him at our team today in this very special day in the ending of the space week so um i would like to first give a brief description of uh, dr narendra prasad sir uh, dr narendra prasad sir is a uh, co-founder or uh, chief operations officer at tacker.co a global marketplace for space based in the netherlands he also serves as a partner to space park kerala a uh, uh, government of kerala initiative to develop a dedicated space economy hub in india he believes that there is an opportunity to create a 25 billion dollars space industry ecosystem in india by 2030 which can take space based products and services from india to the rest of the world he is educated in india germany sweden and france he is also elected as a member of the international institute of space law and an awardee of emerging space leaders by the international astronautical federation narendra prasad sir is the host of new space india podcast so this is a brief description of uh, narendra prasad sir and uh, the most ethical question in today's time in this time span the most common question which is asked by each and every people is that sir how are you because this time span every- Everyone asks this question, "How are you?" Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we haven't, uh, you know, got out of the house uh, for for a while. So six months, uh, I live here in Berlin, in Germany, and uh, we had a very brief trip uh, just after the lockdown, and things got a little better to Denmark. Uh, but after that, you know, things have gone back to the second wave of coronavirus here. So uh, we're just, uh, you know, home, working from home, and uh, luckily, our company only deals with software. So uh, we can have our colleagues work from home without any problem, but uh, many other companies may have some problem because they either produce hardware or you know have to deliver some components to their suppliers to their uh, customers. So uh, so we've been lucky because we do only software. Absolutely, absolutely. So in this uh, period, in this coronavirus period, means everyone is. Uh, couldn't get the education means uh, physically means they have to always attend their online classes, which is a very uh, dilemma for each and every person means they somewhat affect it affects the brain also and for that and someone is also very frustrated because they couldn't get many opportunities in space science. Okay, and they are uh, getting frustrated that what would they do in the future. Okay, so like this many questions we gather today uh, from all the Students from India, for many students of India, for many parts of India, we have the questions which uh, we are going to ask you today. So, uh, mm -hmm. sir, are you ready for the Q and A session? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do my best. So, let's okay, see. Sir. Okay, sir. Thank you so yeah. much, sir. Okay, sir. So the first question is, sir, uh, according to you, what are the different space education opportunities available? available in India? Uh, I would say the options uh, today, as I see it, uh, are good, but uh, may not lead to you know, direct employment uh, on a reasonable basis. Uh, because unfortunately, you know, like the limitation in India is that uh, even if you get educated uh, a lot with respect to, you know, satellites or space, or even if you put your own efforts, uh, there's not much of a big industry that might, uh, you know, appreciate your skill and uh, uh, you know uh, can take you in right so so therefore you know it, it has a reverse effect on uh, education because uh, parents might ask uh, young uh, kids and students and to take up uh, careers that are more secure uh, by becoming you know uh, software engineers or electronics engineers or you know physicists or whatever xyz which uh, can have them uh, uh, better opportunities in terms of shots at uh, better jobs uh, because of course, you know, ISRO does not hire more than like 300 or 400 people every year. Uh, every other institute that does space science, including, let's say, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics or, you know, ISR or many other uh, centers like Ayuka or so on, they may not hire more than 100 or 200 people every year put together. So which means that, you know, in India, uh, if you want to look at the government realm, maybe there are... 600 700 jobs that come up for space related stuff every year and uh, you know the private sector is still very small and uh, very niche i uh, don't think you know even the private sector we create try more than you know like 400 or 500 jobs every year in the sector which means that you know uh, the real like the job market for somebody trying to do space science or, or space technology is not more like than a thousand people a year who would you know like to get in and those are like the thousand lucky people possibly who want to get inside the industry. But you will find that there are millions of people who want to get into the sector. Uh, they have, uh, you know, like uh, either want to become astronauts or, you know, scientists or engineers or, you know, other aspects of uh, space science and technology. So the only way to kind of solve this is to step up the, the industry base uh, so that you have uh, more and more jobs that are being created every year. And that will have, of course, a reverse effect by opening doors to people who, uh, you know, want to then take up careers. And it will also probably, you know, help parents to support uh, young people to, you know, uh, to take the, those career opportunities up and to take some risks so that they can uh, try to, you know, grab those uh, opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Sir. Thank you so much sir, for your answer. I think the uh, person who asked this question has got his answer, will get his answer very nicely. Thank you so much, sir. So, sir, the uh, second question is my personal question. 
uh, is that uh, so there are two categories of people available. Uh, first category being students who like space extremely and actually carry out their future in space. Means they can choose space as their uh, career option. And the second category of people is that some people are there who love space but are actually afraid to uh, pursue it as their career. So what uh, suggestions do you have to the second uh, category of people? Yeah, look, uh, the thing is uh, most often people believe that you have to train in something that is very dedicated uh, studies towards space to become a part of the space industry. And for me, that is the biggest myth uh, because normally, you know, you don't really need a lot of uh, dedicated uh, training and education uh, to be a part of the space industry. Of course, you know, if you want to do something like astrodynamics or, you know, orbital calculations and physics related to uh, space science itself, then you, you may need a lot of the training and everything. But if you are into the technology aspect of it, uh, where you are either developing, you know, mechanical structures or you're trying to develop electronics or you're trying to develop uh, software around uh, that are needed for these uh, missions, then a broad based education is still good enough because ultimately you just need to know, uh, you know, what are the basics of the foundation of, of space. For example, you know, you might have to have electronics where it survives, you know, minus 100 degrees to plus 100 degrees or or you might have to have structures that survive the, the journey of vibrations during launch. So there are some constraints that are, uh, you know, set because it's not like today the constraints uh, are this and tomorrow the constraints are different, right? So space is common I and mean, the, the conditions are same. It will not change. It will never change in the next thousand years at least. So uh, which means that, you know, the, the conditions are more or less the same. Only thing that you need to know as a skill is, uh, to respect those conditions and to involve yourself in either design or or technology development uh, to fit that right so uh, so therefore you know the most uh, common mistake that i see people making is that uh, they think that uh, space is uh, you know as a stream of its own where you need to like know every bit of uh, physics and orbital dynamics and you know a lot of things about planetary science and many other things before you jump in but uh, that is not a necessity if you are doing technology it's very necessary for you to know all of that if you are going to publish a paper on what is happening in the atmosphere of venus or you know what is happening uh, in uh, asteroid belt or something like that there you of course need to know a lot of those kinds of uh, things but if you are in the technology development side you just need to be good at what uh, are the basics in that field so for example today you know there is um, like people doing fpgas in space there are you know, people who are trying to do new technologies in newer ways, uh, which make the cost of uh, satellites themselves very low, for example, right? So those people, they are just, you know, using the experiments on the ground. They are using commercial electronics, uh, industrial grade electronics to experiment on a lot of these things. And they are just, uh, you know, uh, respecting those conditions of uh, environment in space and trying these out in a way that uh, those circuits and you know, those uh, structures or whatever can work in the process, right? So therefore, um, uh, you know, the career in space can be built by just having a good foundation education. And uh, it does not need uh, extremely like focused studies on space itself, uh, as a matter of fact. So it's only a matter of like, you know, finding the right doors to find an internship or, you know, find uh, an opportunity to work in a sector, like, you know, with, a, with some company or some institution that gives you exposure uh, for a mission because that's the most hardest uh, part for anyone who wants to get into the sector because uh, you it's very hard to find an entry door into somebody who is actually building a space mission and to actually get involved in that right so that's the most difficult part unfortunately today in india that uh, activity is more or less centered around three cities in uh, bangalore you know hyderabad and chennai uh, there's not many other avenues uh, that are possible today uh, as an institutional level, at least also on the private sector side uh, in other parts of India. Uh, but yeah, but these are, you know, the hotspots of uh, activity today. And that's where I think uh, people are lucky if you ha you know are in the, one of these cities or, or are able to move to one of these cities to pursue an opportunity with some of the companies that are up and coming. 
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, one more thing, sir, I uh, frequently see that students in the second category of students mainly, they become very mentally uh, suppressed or frustrated. Means they like one thing, but they are pursuing their career in some other things. So then uh, some unusual thoughts come to their mind, like uh, uh, they want to, they could understand what they need to actually do. So uh, these things are very important for students. The things which you told, uh, if they listen to these things, then their life could be changed. So thank you, sir. Uh, the third question, sir, is that according to you, what uh, can be the different space entrepreneurship opportunities that a student can pursue in order to strengthen his base in entrepreneurship? Um, look, the thing is, uh, I if you think very broadly, every person is an entrepreneur uh, because even if, if you are looking for a job at this point of time in the space industry, you have to be kind of entrepreneurial in in pitching yourself to somebody who can give you you know gainful kind of employment, right? But uh, to be very honest with you, entrepreneurship in space is a very difficult uh, idea and very difficult to execute. Uh, because, um, you know, I myself started uh, right outside, outside of university trying to create a company and everything. And I have learned a lot of hard lessons by uh, trying to do a lot of things uh, over the last 10 years time. Uh, so for me, I think uh, for anybody who is starting out in the sector, uh, my advice based on my own experience is if you want to have a little bit more safety net around, you know, starting your own venture or so on. It's better to get involved in the sector in a way that you can learn what is going on, in a way that you can learn who are the people who are relevant in the sector, uh, what is the technology changes that are happening, by working with an organization uh, at the beginning of your career. Uh, because you know that will give you a little bit of a launch pad to understand what is happening in the sector. Normally, you need you know between five and seven years to know really what are the uh, technology aspects, you know, what are the uh, organizational aspects? Where are people really, you know, making money? Where are people losing money? Where are the new opportunities? Uh, how much does it cost to build any particular kind of mission? What kind of people you need to build something? All of these, you know, and also to build credibility for you to, uh, for somebody to invest in your idea. Because if you are, uh, you know, like right out of the college and you don't have any um, proper skills that you can show for as credibility skills, then it will become very hard for you to get any investor to really back you, right? So, uh, so therefore, it's very important that you uh, show credibility by having experience. And to if if not, then you you can still do it as a student. Like you know, the guys from Bellatrix, for example, are a very good example. Coming out of right out of the college and you know trying to build a company. In their case, they still did a project while they were students by raising uh, you know twenty lakhs or something like that from uh, Jindal. Uh, family to pursue their thruster idea. So, you know, it shows that uh, they were willing to like go outside the realm of uh, academic curricul curriculum to be able to like, you know, do something that is outside the box, which are their own original ideas to show intent that uh, what they are trying to do is credible by building some hardware and showcasing that, right? So, most often, I think the uh, problem is that most people they end up creating PowerPoint companies. So basically, you just have a PowerPoint presentation of your ideas, and uh, you don't have anything beyond just a PowerPoint presentation, right? So that is where you know you have to like uh, move further uh, because ultimately, you know that uh, will not take you so far uh, because soon you might uh, find people not interested in your idea or not credible enough to invest in you or you know, your own parents and family might pressurize you to say that, you know, you're not earning anything or you're not uh, doing anything that is useful. Why don't you go take a job? Or there's many other pressures that come up uh, to, to in a, that is even outside, you know, your control, right? So that is uh, a lot of the things that can happen. So therefore, you know, my advice uh, for anybody starting out who don't want to risk a lot, of course, you know, if you have a strong family background, you are able to sustain a number of years without really your family depending on you for uh, their you know survival or so on then it's always you know uh, luxury for you to try a lot of things by your own but uh, i would imagine that more than 90% of the students will not be in that category in india 
um and uh, it will be much difficult for them to like you know support all these kinds of things uh, while they have to support their family or whatever right so that uh, that is how it is so you have to kind of respect um, the local situation and your own uh, uh, environment and also your own you know setting because if somebody in the us is like uh, you know trying to say i'll become i don't know like uh, mark zuckerberg or something like that you have to know that mark zuckerberg's family is like you know already millionaires possibly before they would allow him to you know experiment on something like this because even if he loses one or two years uh, there's nothing happens you know for them they have the basis to just go back to do something else uh, but but yeah that's where i think um, you have to kind of respect a little bit of your own background uh, so that you have the balance otherwise you might best be like uh, trying to copy somebody uh and that copy may not be very exact uh, so you might not be knowing what is the background of all, all of those people um and uh, and then you might say okay you know if that person is successful why am i not but you wouldn't have studied the reasons why that person is successful uh just beyond the you know the technology and so on so therefore you know you have to kind of uh, know you know where where are your beginnings and uh, and it, and and everything should be a small step in that matter so so that's where you know you have to reflect and it's always good to build a team because i see a lot of people coming up with uh, own, their own ideas and uh, often you know space missions and anything related to space uh, not normally no one person can do it uh, it's always you know good to build a credible team around you who have complementary skill sets so if you are good at uh, i don't know programming or something to get uh, 10 other people also good at programming is not a good idea it's good, good to have you know a diversity in the team where you have different skill sets coming in and you know they are complementing kind of each other and you know that way a team will also support each other in uh, ups and downs uh, and so so otherwise you know it becomes very easy for somebody to de- get demotivated saying i am trying so hard and i am not getting any results or so on uh, so therefore you know building a team around you who can also not just support the development but also you know keep up the morale while things are down is also kind of very important yes sir absolutely sir absolutely and uh, during the situation uh, most of the people have a tendency to go towards uh, financial stability so everyone is uh, starting with uh, entrepreneurship or startups or something like that yes absolutely okay sir so the next question is that sir, how to start a space company from nothing and also how to make a great team how to stabilize the team yeah so uh, the best case on how to start a space startup is uh, if you have a problem that you see that you yourself face uh, or you identify a problem that uh, somebody else faces and uh, not just a problem a problem that somebody is willing to pay for to be solved and that's the difficult part because you might say that uh, this is a problem and uh, the the problem is that um, you know like for example uh, i uh, i might have a problem that uh, when i order groceries uh, i want it to be delivered the next 60 seconds afterwards so now i order the, the grocery i want it delivered in 60 seconds because you know i've run out of salt or whatever it is but uh, if i if the you know uh, grocery store tells me if i have to deliver to you in like 60 seconds time it will cost you 1000 rupees for me to come and deliver it to you within like 5 minutes time for example and the salt itself cost like you know 10 rupees per packet uh, then it doesn't make any sense because uh, you know i'm not going to be paying 1000 rupees to the grocery store to give me salt in you know uh, uh, in 5 minutes time right so it's a problem because i've run out of salt uh, but i'm not going to be paying 1000 rupees to get it delivered in 5 minutes time. so you know that is the kind of uh, typical uh, let's say problem set that comes to everybody because a lot of people might identify problems but very little problem very little people will identify problems that somebody is willing to pay for to be to be solved right so those are very two different things there and uh, so therefore you know it's uh, it's difficult to find ideas that uh, people are willing to be uh, you know to pay for to be solved and uh, that's the goal you know of um, any uh, any entrepreneurship uh, uh, venture uh, and the crux of it is this find something that people are 
willing to pay for to be solved. Uh, and uh, you know, those can be done in small steps. Uh, those can be done by creating small uh, proof of concepts by showing people you know small steps that you've uh, tried to put together in uh, and breaking it down in a way that uh, uh, it people can connect to that that you are going to solve a bigger problem and you know small solving it in smaller pieces but earning money you know through the course of it right so that is something that uh, people can think of and uh, and so on uh, the the most difficult part alongside finding problems that people will pay for to be solved is uh, putting uh, together a team because uh, uh, entrepreneurship is a very uh, difficult uh, venture in that sense because uh, people might lose interest very quickly if they don't don't see the kind of uh, results that they intend for. And uh, today, uh, the problem is in the last ten years, uh, there's a lot of hype around uh, what is a startup and you know why startups are great or you know so on. So this is all I would say a lot of hype around uh, uh, startups themselves. But you have to know that most often startups don't have money, they don't have resources, they don't have many other things that are there. For it's only like the glory that people you see on the social media often talking about all the things. Apart from the social media updates, they will have nothing more, more or less, or a lot, ninety percent of the time. So, uh, so therefore, you know, it's uh, important to like one um, have people who have uh, the same kind of uh, vision but different skill sets because uh, if if you have the same kind of skill set and the same kind of vision it doesn't work because you don't have the complete array of skill sets that is needed to solve a particular problem um, and so therefore it's important to have like a similar vision but different skill sets to be able to solve the problems that come up uh, you know in that particular area right and um, and also you know uh, a lot of a uh, lot of us are very good engineers or very good scientists or very good physicists or whatever it is but um, of course you know a startup uh, needs somebody who is a business person who knows how to sell ideas and you know sell uh, customers and how to sell um, you know get money from them and so on so it's always not good to get a collection of technology people and say we are going to build a startup because uh, that almost never works out because uh, normally engineers like to like be perfectionists and uh, in that case, you might not have any person who really knows how to handle customers, you know, how to attract them, how to get uh, them to sign up, how to pay, uh, how, how to get them to pay to you. So those are also very important, uh, you know, problems to solve where you have people around who, who of course, you know, the technology or the particular, uh, you know, product that you're building becomes the core of it. But you also need a very credible and a very skilled uh, person who is handling you know, business development and sales and everything who can really uh, understand both the technology and the market gaps and are able to you know bridge that uh, together right so those are kind of very uh, important uh, skills uh, and the team to have and the last thing that i would like to highlight is uh, one of the most important is uh, actually also the ethics of uh, founders or the founding team itself uh, because you know let's say you know you have uh, today a team that you are putting together of five six people and the team is uh, where you are 100% committed and somebody else is 20% committed or 30% committed or you know somebody is uh, doing uh, 10 other things on the side to uh, to you know to make themselves comfortable then uh, not dedicating time to you while you are struggling you know uh, putting your 100% then the there's a mismatch in your team uh, and uh, and soon that will reflect because it will show in the results over time uh, you know, after six months, you'll be wondering why did I spend so much time and why hasn't somebody else spent so much time in getting the same sort of results that I have. And, uh, you know, then a lot of the cracks will come up in uh, relationships between people within the teams and so on. So, so it's very important to have a very, uh, you know, foundational ethics of all the team members should be very, uh, the same and the people should be able to like communicate each other, even if they have problems between them. In a very open fashion to work them out uh, to to then you know build something sustainable. But otherwise, you know, all of this, uh, if it is not very transparent, then uh, you know it will show over time, and of course, you will just fizzle out, uh, not having to continue any of this. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much.
So the next question, which uh, which I'm going to ask you, sir, this question is asked by a uh, student of computer science. So he has uh, literally appeared in front of you to give him some ideas. So I'm reading the question. Uh, so I'm pursuing BSc computer science second year. Is there any chance for me to join and work in space sector after completing my PG or PhD? If so, please give me some ideas. It will be very helpful for me. I am very enthusiastic about space and universe and about to join ISRO. I want to join ISRO. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a tremendous amount of opportunities only. It depends on, uh, you know, where you want to contribute. Because uh, today, if you look at uh, a lot of the hardware, it is moving towards software defined hardware, uh, which means that people are looking to way uh, in ways in which uh, things can be reprogrammed, reconfigured, you know, software to be uploaded to on board of satellites, even if they have flown already. And, and those are, you know, some of the aspects that are very core and key. Uh, you can imagine, you know, in the recent uh, SpaceX flight, for example, they had a touch screen for astronauts, which is the first time in like 50 or 60 years that even astronauts are using touch screen on a rocket. You know, think of how much, how much software reliability that kind of, uh, you know, mechanism should have. Uh, while people, you know, switches are always easy, right? So you can operate very easily, you can fix them very easily. But today, you know, the, the sector has gone to such a level where, you know, even astronauts are using iPads uh, on, on, you know, like space station or whatever to be able to do that, right? So there's an incredible amount of, uh, you know, opportunity in that case. Uh, there are, of course, uh, today also a lot of opportunities in things like uh, data science, you know, artificial intelligence that is all uh, uh, having a lot of uh, new opportunities in the space sector. For example, there's a number of companies, even in India, for example, that are using satellite uh, imagery to build uh, insights uh, on, let's say, how much agricultural land we have or how much forest cover we have or, you know, many other such aspects. And there, you know, you need a skill set of knowing how to process that uh, imagery. Uh, and today there's even uh, people who are doing cloud-based technologies like Amazon or, you know, Microsoft Azure or many others who are entering the space sector by providing cybersecurity products to, you know, space data or so on. So uh, there is tremendous amount of opportunities that are uh, up and coming. Now the question is, you know, how do you like, um, you know, shape your skills in, in, your, in, your, in your domain uh, in a way that it suits the requirements of these companies? That is where I think you need to do a little bit uh, research to know that uh, if I am a, let's say, a computer science person and I like satellite imagery, I can learn, uh, you know, geospatial techniques and image processing techniques to be able to build a career around, you know, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence that goes into satellite imagery and satellite video, for example. And uh, if I'm somebody who is, uh, let's say, um, uh, doing software and I want to get into a little bit more of the hardware side of computer science, then I can learn a little bit of, uh, you know, FPGA or ASIC or something like that, where I can do a lot more of the embedded hardware based uh, computer science, uh, you know, work uh, than, than, let's say, pure software work. So it really depends on uh, which you think is, uh, is of interest to you and uh, where you can see uh, yourself shape. And the best is, of course, to simply open up a, a jobs portal, which are which space companies are you know putting their requirements for, and uh, looking at the list of requirements that they have to see if you match that requirement. Because if you are able to open up a job portal and say that uh, you know the, here's an entry level job and this is the skill set we are looking for, and if you match that skill set, that that means that you have the skill set that the industry wants. And so even if you are you know, two years ahead of graduating, you can simply open up a job portal in uh, one of the space industry outlets and see just see what are the skills they are looking for. And then you, know, you can spend uh, the one or two years to build up that kind of skill set to say to these people, whenever you're ready to graduate or whenever you're ready to take up the job, you can then say that, okay, you know, I prepared for it for two years and I know that this is what the industry is looking for. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much sir, for your answer. Uh, the next question is uh, asked by a person. The question is, recently I heard about Agnikul Cosmos, a Chennai-based startup raising funds, and it's also trained by IIT Madras Incubator. Can you please tell me the procedure to get into Incubator, and can you please tell me how to raise funds? 
Yeah, so the uh, thing is, uh, most often the the guy from uh, the guys from Agnikul Cosmos, for example, I think uh, they got into the IIT uh, Chennai accelerator because uh, uh, one of the professors from IIT Chennai supported their idea, and uh, you know he then helped the company to be a part of the accelerator or the incubator program there. But uh, generally, you know what happens is. Uh, you need to have, uh, as you say, you know, the credible idea, a credible team, and there's, and you know, present that. And there are, of course, incubators in IAC, IITs, and many others where you can present yourself. But again, you know, it comes down to this credibility of the team and the idea, which will get evaluated and uh, which will get supported. But you also look, need to to be a little bit strategic on where you will get yourself incubated, because. The reason why, for example, uh, you know, uh, Agnikul Cosmos went to this uh, IIT Madras accelerator is because they have a combustion lab there, which they run. And IIT Chennai has that combustion lab, which is a unique lab, which, uh, you know, which will help them uh, do a lot of the propulsion related tests for their launch vehicle. So which means that they don't need to really invest in those uh, infrastructure and can simply use the resources from the lab uh, that they have. Right. So. Uh, this is, you know, the kind of uh, thinking that you need to have in a way uh, where you need to look at what the incubator is going to give you because most often none of the incubators in India will give you crores or rupees to build any, you know, uh, product that you want. They will probably just give you a little bit of office space and maybe a little bit of money to work with. Uh, but most often it's just to have a look out for what infrastructure that you have, they have that you can use that are beyond just office space. Uh, and you know what is uh, if there are professors there who can help you, you know, uh, acting as advisors in the technology or building, or you know they have uh, some you know special uh, laboratories like you know this combustion lab or something which you can access. So those are the kind of things that you can have. But of course, you know if you are in IIT uh, Chennai or uh, you're in uh, IIC, then of course the credibility also builds up in the ability for you to also maybe get some investor attention. Because you are in, in incubated in that particular place, but incubation is just a process of uh, building up a you know like a company. It's not really uh, not many companies may need it. Uh, some companies may need it. Some companies companies may not need it. Uh, but it's you know it's a it's a choice. It's not compulsory that you have to go to an incubator. But uh, if you go to some of them which have these kinds of uh, things that they can offer you, maybe it makes sense uh, because otherwise, you know, you, you may have to invest your own money in building up a lot of the infrastructure, especially it especially makes sense if there are labs that you can use through uh, through the incubator and pay very little for that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question is, uh, what was your journey of starting up tapsearch.co? Uh, can you share some details on how the company works and how did you get the idea to start a space tech company? Yeah, so uh, Sat Search, you know, began in uh, 2016. It's been already four years uh, since the uh, the idea took place. In fact, uh, the idea began at a hackathon. It's a two-day hackathon uh, in uh, in one of the cities in Germany called Bremen where uh, you know basically some people came about and said let's do a two day hackathon in 48 hours let's see what uh, we can build uh, that may you know turn out to be a company and um, sat search came about this idea because uh, you know um, our team had a thought that uh, basically there's no centralized play place where people can look for components or suppliers and uh, the idea in the 48 hours was to build something like a google search for the space industry, and uh, and of course you know the the idea won like a prize at the event, but uh, but we wanted to kind of continue you know building that and see if they can actually build a company around it, where we kind of help engineers to find suppliers and components, and at the same time we can help suppliers you know to do business using our platform. Uh, we spent almost uh, you know three years uh, looking at uh, what are the possibilities for us to. You know, uh, monetize because uh, we ourselves had to look at uh, how do you actually build a business or model around this. Uh, because anybody can build a you know a directory where they have suppliers and products, but it's very difficult to ask people to pay for that to access that thing. 
so we had to learn a lot around uh, the idea of how do you you know build a business model around this and uh, how do you like you know put together something sustainable and scalable so we uh, got also some help from the european space agency uh, by you know us entering the incubation program there so we entered the european space agency's uh, business incubation program and we spent two years really talking to a lot of people um, you know understanding the industry a lot uh, understanding you know what will people pay for and what will people not pay for how much can people pay to be on our platform on a monthly basis or a yearly basis or so on and uh, talking to a lot of uh, experts on um, even on the sales side how do you actually you know build a, a model of sales that can work for your company so we spent a lot of time around all of this and uh, fortunately we had a very complementing team because uh, we had one colleague who comes from the computer science background and you know he was taking care of all the technology development we had uh, one colleague who is really coming from uh, ideation of the product itself and and how the product should look like and uh, you know based on his own experience could give a lot of insight um and for example me i had spent a lot of time talking to a lot of suppliers uh, over time and uh, i knew for example you know who do you, who can we approach as customers for or you know how do you build a, a sales model around all of this a little bit so we uh, put together all of this but it took us uh, uh, about you know two and a half three years to come up with a model that is uh, scalable in a way it can work work but uh, we all had like you know uh, our own side jobs and uh, uh, side uh, you know things that we did to be able to you know live our life for the for the two and a half years uh, while we built up this company so my colleagues you know uh, they were working two days in a week or three days in a week at a different company just to earn their living and uh, and so we just you know um, uh, had enough earning on the side so that we don't need to have any other investor or depend on anybody else to to build up the company uh, but once we saw that uh, we started getting customers and we started getting more projects and everything uh, so for example at the beginning of this year uh, all of us quit what we were doing and we started doing uh, this full time uh, because we started getting enough traction we started getting enough customer base and everything so today we have customers in close to 20 different countries at this point of time and uh, we operate as uh, uh, as a full you know fully blown company we have uh, started hiring people uh, and uh, we we see a future where uh, we stand to be um, a pretty good company to you know be a part of the industry in uh, trying to build something very new in the industry so it's taken us a while so for me i think it's a uh, any space company takes minimum of 5 to 7 years to achieve some sort of a development it's not like a android app or an ios app where you you know they spend some time program something in one quarter and you put it out and maybe it clicks you are millionaire you are a millionaire and if it doesn't click you can go to the next you know project and do something else or build another app doesn't work like that way uh, it works like really into by knowing what is the problems in the industry and that's why you know you need to really spend time and to know what are the gaps and everything else and to kind of you know build up over time so uh, you can see that with many other companies as well in india like bellatrix has been around for like 6 or 7 years now uh, they you know they have spent so much time just to get the kind of credibility that they have uh, to be able to scale to a certain level so it's the same with many 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 other companies as well right so you will see that they have spent 7 to 10 years before they come out of the startup phase uh and and that's the sort of the timeline you need to be prepared for so so therefore you know if somebody is thinking oh i'll spend 6 months or a year in this and see if what happens will not work and i can assure you that it will not work possibly and uh, you need to be able to uh be able to have this open idea mindset that you will spend that amount of time before you achieve something there thank you so much sir thank you so much uh, so out of all these uh, professional questions uh, we all have a very interesting question uh, for you uh, is that uh, what do you think about mass colonization what are your uh, thing uh, thinking or what are your ideas about mass colonization um yeah i mean the thing is uh, there is of course uh, you know uh, this topic has been around for uh, quite a while 
uh, where people are thinking about. Uh, so I don't really like the word colonization uh, because uh, colonization is uh, means oppression. Uh, because yeah. if you are have a, like India was a colony of the British Empire, right? So and they were kind of uh, oppressing Indians to favor themselves, uh, and we were a colony, a British colony. So uh, colonization is a very negative tone to use, which means that you are kind of oppressing somebody or you're, you're taking away resources from somebody. Uh, a better word to use is a space settlement or a Mars settlement, uh, where you can say that you are trying to like, you know, whatever, create a new settlement there or uh, by having, you know, an outpost there or so on. Uh, of course, you know, that uh, will take a lot of time and effort from this point of time. Uh, because it's not very habitable at this point of time. Uh, Mars is not really a habitable place, and you need to do a lot of um, transformation uh, of, uh, of Mars uh, in in a way that is ha habitable. Uh, but yeah, but it's also about um, why should people go there, right? Because if you think about it uh, from a logical perspective, the people who, let's say, left India to go to work in the Middle East or you know, uh, US or Europe or wherever, they went there because there are better economic opportunities for them there. Otherwise, they would not leave, right? They, if, they, if you earn the same sort of money in India, you would stay there and you work there because you are from there, your family is there, why would you want to leave uh, if you have the same kind of opportunities there uh, than here? So, uh, and that's the case with anybody, like uh, the case where, why, you know, for example, the Spanish Empire sent uh, Columbus to for, to find India was because they wanted to find a new trade route for spices, and they discovered America in the in the process. And the goal is always to get something out of it that benefits you, right? So the question that uh, we haven't really still answered uh, to a large extent is why should somebody risk their life to leave Earth? Uh, and you know, if it's just for the kicks of it. It can be like going to Wanderla or you know one of these uh, entertainment parks where you will just go there for a minute or uh, one day you can spend some time going there. You will have a nice experience of going to an adventure park or a water sport, and uh, you will come back thinking that's uh, just a fun activity that we do. Uh, but this is not uh, sustainable in that way because it's not like you will want to go to you know water sport park every week, uh, right? It will get boring after a while. Uh, so most often people go to do things where uh, they will eventually earn something out of it. And, you know, there's an economic payout uh, for somebody to do something there. So we have to still find out a way in which that can be um, proven that, you know, that in, only then people will have uh, uh, the competition to go get, get it, right? Um, you know, that is one of the reasons why you see so much competition for, you know, if there are jobs in US or whatever, in the Middle East or so on, people are like, you know, try, trying to compete and, you know, trying to get the best because they know that, you know, when they get that, they will get something out of it. And uh, we need to fi figure out what that is for Mars, for example. If it is, you know, some resource that there is that we can take back to the Earth and, you know, people on the Earth will be able to pay for it. That is one model for it. Uh, or, for example, if there is a imminent threat uh, uh, that there is uh, on the Earth itself and, you know, for you to go to Mars, is, uh, you will be safer than living on the Earth, for example. You know, then there is uh, an ability for somebody to take that risk. Uh, but just for the sake of it, uh, it will not be very sustainable. So, uh, so that is, you know, that is actually, that is my view. I don't know, maybe people may disagree to my view. Uh, but this is the kind of the logic I would see uh, as more sustainable to creating a, a Mars outpost or a settlement. Yes, absolutely, sir. So uh, I would actually like, uh, like a, um, add to uh, the, this point that uh, people are thinking of uh, settlement in Mars. So mankind couldn't do anything. So if they are thinking of settle, settling in Mars, so they can also make uh, the, this Earth to uh, a better place to live in. They can also make this Earth a place to live in. So there's no point in Mars if Earth is only our place, so we can make a better place from this situation. Uh, so the next question is, uh, will amateur rocketry workshop ever be initiated at India? 
Yeah, I mean, there are already several teams that are doing amateur rocketry in India. There is a company called uh, uh, Rocketeers, uh, which provides uh, model rockets. Uh, and maybe they even will try to do amateur rocket uh, workshops or, you know, maybe larger am uh, amateur rockets as well. You can talk to them. There's another initiative called uh, Star in uh, Surat or some uh, someplace in Gujarat, uh, where they are trying to do also amateur rockets and uh, uh, they are trying to do these uh, model rockets as well. So, and there is, of course, you know, SSCRD, I think, is also trying to do something in amateur rockets and amateur rocketry as well. So there are, of course, you know, a few of them that have uh, come up in the last few years that are uh, trying to tackle this opportunity with, re with respect to amateur rocketry. I'm sure that there'll be more coming, but it's not like it's not present in India. It, it's certainly present. People just need to go and find them. Thank you so much, sir. Um, this question, sir, which ocean sensor is perfect balloon bomb space exploration project at an altitude of 40 kilometers? I, uh, to be very honest with you, I have to look it up by myself because I'm not an uh, atmosphere uh, expert. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'm sure that uh, there are, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, different radio zones or whatever, ozone zones that are uh, you know available to to uh, look at uh, the, the the environment there uh, but the problem is that uh, today it's actually quite difficult to go to 40 kilometers whoever asked that question it's actually quite difficult to go to 40 kilometers using a high altitude balloon so i myself have uh, been involved in high altitude ballooning for a long time and most of the cheaper rubber balloons can do hardly like 15 20 kilometers and only if you have, uh, you know, like um, uh, helium balloons that are very, very expensive and helium itself is very expensive. Uh, only if you have some of these helium uh, balloons that are quite expensive uh, and very high quality ones, they may go up to 30, 35 kilometers. Uh, but yeah, but uh, that's something that to keep in mind. Yes, sir. yes sir. absolutely. Yes, sir. The next question is, sir, uh, now since LIGO is being constructed in India, how will it affect the space research in India and how could undergraduates in India could aim to work for it and be a part of this amazing development? Yeah, again, you know, this is, uh, there are two ways uh, to be involved in it. One is you uh, get yourself involved on the technology side uh, where people are, you know, involved in the, in the construction of the, whole, uh, you know, Lego stuff itself. Uh, there you are looking at more of the, you know, like not really space hardware, you're then looking at just uh, hardware on the ground that can be developed uh, in that sense. So it may not be really a space job there. It's more of the, you know, core electronics and computer science backgrounds that come into place at that point of time. Uh, but I guess, you know, there's an opportunity for uh, people who want to get into like uh, science, the space science part of it, they may have an opportunity to do uh, experiment backed, uh, you know, like science in India, because most often people are doing a lot of the theoretical work and they are using either, you know, uh, uh, theory building used, uh, you know, based science, or, you know, they're using some results from some of the satellites or some results from some of the other uh, uh, particle accelerators or whatever. So, but then, you know, in this case, there's a unique opportunity because, uh, we will have the infrastructure ourselves that uh, there's been new set of uh, people who are going to come up who are going to run the uh, run the facility to you know, provide original results and uh, original scientific analysis and possibly some original results through all of that so that's where i think it will be a very niche but i don't think so again you know it's not something that will generate hundreds of jobs in that sense uh, it might generate hundreds of jobs in the construction of the whole thing, but the scientific community that will use the, the, the whole thing and then will produce the results or analyze the results will be a, a few tens of scientists. Yes, sir. So the next question is, sir, uh, um, asked by a CAC artificial intelligence expert, uh, sir, I am in the CSC artificial intelligence and machine learning sector. Does this information carry any role in future space endeavors? 
Yeah, I mean, this is something that we already discussed in that sense where, you know, I already talked about um, how uh, satellite imagery has a direct implication for the uh, machine learning. Uh, so, for example, today, if you want to count, let's say, how many aircrafts are grounded around the world, you can build a machine learning model that uh, is based on satellite imagery of airports to identify aircrafts as objects and to then count how many are grounded and, and then, you know, correlate that with uh, the overall number of aircrafts, for example. So that's just one example. There's incredibly more number of examples that you can give. Uh, people like uh, many of the uh, trading companies in financial trades, they use a lot of this kind of machine learning algorithms already to tell what is a footfall in a particular store, for example, in Walmart or you know IKEA or whatever, how many people are coming and going, for example, to know how much trade is being done there. Uh, there's a lot of those kinds of you know uh, machine learning based uh, uh, models that are up and coming. More recently, there's a Norwegian initiative to map uh, the forest cover around the world and how it's been changing or you know increasing or decreasing. And uh, you can see a lot of that kind of global scale models that will come up uh, to monitor resources uh, to ensure you know uh, we are sustainable in the future and uh, the climate change decreases the effects uh, and the rate at which it is decreasing. So you can you know build a lot of the solutions uh, that uses uh, satellite data. Uh, and sensors in a way that uh, you know there are outcomes that that will be helpful for people to make decision on top, and so that uh, presents a lot of opportunity for sure. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question, sir, is asked from a student of grade twelve. So he asked that as a student of grade twelve from CBSE board. What course or competitive exam should I clear so that I could enter space research? Also, what are the eligibility and qualities required to take up a career in space research? Um, so if you are in like the 12th grade, uh, the best case scenario is you like uh, enter the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology or you enter uh, the one of the ICERs or so on. Uh, where you're doing physics or you know in IIST's case you are doing something related to space technology or space science um, that's where you can directly get into the space theme uh, and learn a lot more which are dedicated to space studies but of course you know that's not the end of the road uh, you can still do a lot of the specialization in electronics or computer science or whatever xyz physics or chemistry or biology because also today you have astrobiology astrochemistry you know a lot of other sectors that are coming in as well so it's only a matter of uh, how do you want to which theme excites you more and uh, what excites you more and uh, how do you link that with the space sector yes sir absolutely sir so uh, this is a question my personal question is that uh, what are the opportunities that an astrophysicist can get in india I mean, what are the job opportunities for an astrophysicist in india uh, so, I mean, there are very challenging, I think the job opportunities are quite challenging because uh, the number of uh, research institutions are very less. Um, you might find some opportunities in uh, uh, IUCA or your, in IAA or Raman Research Institute or PRL um, and, you know, maybe a couple of other institutions. But beyond this, there are uh, quite limited uh, opportunities. So, uh, so yeah, so you have to be mindful that uh, these are the premier uh, kind of research institutions uh, for you to get involved in. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, that, uh, that's where I think, you know, you need to know again within the astrophysics community, where are you specializing? Because astrophysics is a very, very, very uh, big field. And uh, you can do a lot of theoretical work. You can do practical, like, you know, uh, experimental work. You can do planetary studies. You can do you know, uh, uh, solar studies, you can do so many other kind of studies within astrophysics. It's a question of, you know, which institute has which focus area and uh, how does your interest uh, match with that? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is probably the last question which I have for you, sir. Uh, it is our highest group has just passed his class 12th. So he has written that I am a 12th pass student and I am extremely interested in space science, but didn't have top marks in exams. 
and here is ADL scope of aerospace engineering is very low. So, sir, can you please guide me? How can I create scope in opportunities in space sector in India? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, uh, the marks and everything, grades, uh, it only matters to a certain point of time. Uh, beyond that, you know, people don't ask. Uh, although I, you know, studied uh, several years ago, nobody comes and asks me, what is your degree certificate at this point of time? Uh, because, you know, like uh, they ask me what skills you have and, you know, what you have worked on as projects and what you have delivered at this point of time. Uh, I haven't really seen anybody ask my grade sheet uh, in a long, long time after, uh, uh, you know, uh, having gone through all of this by myself. So it's a question of, you know, like, um, what are you good at in skill sets? So for example, uh, if you ask me, like I had my own interests uh, and I was good at a few things and I was really bad at a few things. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, the things that I'm good at, uh, I should know what I'm good at. You know, because most people, they don't even know what they like and what they are good at. And uh, that's the problem, you know, in this, because uh, uh, essentially, let's say you, you are uh, very, very, very good at uh, software programming and you really don't like chemistry or biology or something, but you're forced to learn that uh, because it's a part of your curriculum or so on. Of course, you know, you'll maybe do very badly in it and you have a bad grade or whatever it is, but you might be very, very good at, uh, you know, like doing the other things uh, that... Uh, that are there so that that's one of the reasons why all of this project based uh, you know approach becomes very interesting because it allows you to like you know sh shape your uh, knowledge in 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 your own interests and to build projects that uh, are low cost and uh, you know in your own time to build that credibility up so for example if you want to enter the aerospace sector you know maybe you've designed your own drone algorithm for autopilot system or maybe you come up your own with your own drone design that is working and you can show you know it doesn't take uh, lakhs of rupees to do that it only takes maybe you know a few thousand rupees to build some something like that or you know you build something on your own hardware a new pcb you know that you have designed that uh, changes something with a new microcontroller or new something else on top of it so it can all be done uh, by but it's a question of um, uh, starting or thinking small in a way that it connects to something bigger. Uh, because most often I think people think uh, I have to start by, you know, designing an autonomous car directly. It, you cannot do it because that needs like uh, uh, tens of people, hundreds of people, like, uh, crores of rupees to be able to do that. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the fun is in actually thinking about what can you do with very little resources and little time. Uh, but you can do systematically one step at a time that becomes bigger over time. And uh, that's the most difficult part of thinking, uh, to think small always. Uh, that's also in a company level because we ourselves, you know, for example, when we are thinking about our own company, we also think, you know, we should be having all of these things and we should be building that and this and everything else. But we cannot do it because we don't have the resources. We don't have so many people. We don't have so much money to invest in all of this. But we should be very smart at thinking what is the next thing that we can build given the constraint and resources that we have, constraint in the number of team members we have and the amount of money we can spend into this, right? So that's the same approach uh, for a student or for a company that is out there. So that's where, you know, I would say uh, anybody looking into this uh, should, uh, you know, think from their perspective. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, sir, uh, I, have one, I have my personal question. Uh, like, there were lots of people uh, who worked dedicatedly to get into ISRO. But uh, in last few months, uh, they have decreased the intake ratio. Uh, I, I saw that uh, spreading viral in all the social medias. Uh, like, what are the different ways you would like to suggest for them? Uh, like, what are the alternatives for those people you want to suggest? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, look, um, corona, coronavirus situation means that maybe the government is not having as much tax revenues as it originally has, which means that it will have a direct imp impact on the number of scientists being employed at ISRO. So I do see this trajectory where a um, uh, number of, uh, you know, engineer scientist positions that are created in ISRO is, will reduce because of this financial impact on the Indian economy. The... 
the the way i see it is that um, there'll be more opportunities in the startup and the private sector world in the next few uh, years than uh, than isro itself and that is how isro is also trying to support the private sector because they know that you know the, the there are constraints to how much money they can ask the government every year and how many new positions that they can create and how many you know uh, missions that they can build and uh, if they can kind of empower the private sector to take up a lot of the kind of the activities and they focus on more on the research part and the uh, you know like the usual delivery of the satellites and the services it can be offloaded to a lot of these industries that's where you see will uh, will will have a lot more companies today the game changing also aspect is that companies like airtel and nelco from tata are all uh, trying to enter the space sector so uh, you know airtel has bought one web a uh, british uh, company that is doing uh, satellite internet uh, nelco is also partnered with another company called telesat that is doing satellite based internet i'm sure that you know at some point of time even maybe reliance and other companies will enter the space sector and uh, that's when you know you will see many many more, more jobs created because when these uh, companies come up they will come with hundreds of crores of rupees in investment not like you know few crore rupees that a startup will be able to raise right and that's when we will see uh, much more opportunities coming up in the next years yeah thank you sir thank you so much sir thank you so much for answering all our questions uh, frankly speaking your answers uh, was where i was feeling like i was he hearing golden words from you your answers were just like golden words to me because if any student follows your way, your answers they can change their life they can change their life what they are thinking they can also reframe their thinking and they can change everything so thank you sir for giving us uh, the uh, ideas and this all answers which you gave so uh, i would like to hand over the session to our ceo mr ubang sudani for delivering the vote of thanks yeah sure thank you thank you for giving this opportunity thank you so much sir for uh, giving your valuable time Uh, to giving the uh, students question as well as the our questions uh, it's very inspirational a uh, journey for uh, for for us and um, uh, thank you so much uh, for giving the very simple manner questions uh, question answer session uh, we will also look forward in the future with you uh, to question answer session like this thank you very much uh, for giving your uh, giving your valuable time to us thank you sir yeah thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, i wish you guys the uh, very best of luck as you yeah. you know continue to do what you like and uh, hopefully you know uh, i will have some of you as colleagues in the industry in the coming years yeah sure sir sure, sure thank you very much sir yeah thank you bye bye sure. thank you bye 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 sir thank you bye yeah yeah guys session was amazing Yeah. <laughs> Bye bye. <Bob. laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. cover only. Yeah, one and three hours, one hour and three minutes. Amazing, amazing. I have, yeah, I have seen so many questions, you know, because I was seeing the 